Good, off, good evening. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Philip Spencer. I wish to first um, express my appreciation for the deep sense of inspiration that, that I'm sure we all felt this evening, particularly, well, in all the presentations, but particularly in the comments of His Excellency President Robinson. Some people might know that I had the privilege professionally to work very closely with His Excellency during the period 1997 to 2003. And if you know the history, I'm sure you know the history of the court. So 1998 was one particular milestone, and then 2003 was another. And what I wanted to highlight and, and perhaps throw to the panel for their comments would be the fact that in advancing from 1998 to the actual establishment of the, well, the, the inauguration of the court in 2003, I witnessed um, his Excellency lead a mobilization of civil society um, NGOs. In fact, I heard one of the panelists refer to No Peace Without Justice, which in fact is an organization that became very involved in, in, in promoting the work of the, the ICC. And insofar as small states may not have in the international system the traditional political clout, there clearly seems to have been a lesson drawn from the, the process of the ICC that within small states, there is the capacity to mobilize the non-traditional forms of social power to help influence the outcome and promote advocacy for things that we would want to have see, um, advance in the United Nations system. And so I'm wondering whether it's a view that the that the panel would, would, would want to support as something that small states should adopt more aggressively in the way in which we engage in the, in the United Nations system that is engaging alongside of state-driven um, pursuit of, of, of its international political agenda, the involvement of civil society. In my presentation on the panel on uh, 21st century security, I highlighted that one of the things that supported much of the advance in, in, in attempting to address threats new and emerging threats to security, was the fact there was now a convergence of interests held by state actors with those interests held by non-state actors. And so in that regard, I think it might be something that, that we could um, pursue more aggressively, and I'd like to get some thoughts, if possible, from the panel. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence, Chair. Um, Tim Shaw, your host. Uh, let me echo everybody's very warm uh, sentiments towards the uh, previous president, prime minister, and also um, head of the Tobago Assembly. We're very honored to have you here, sir, and very much appreciate uh, the effort uh, and the, the consideration. I just want to ask a question about Uganda, uh, because as some of you know, a few years ago I was a graduate student there. Um, and Uganda, like Sudan, has led to controversies in the court uh, over the LRA. And Mr. Museveni um, is a very wily leader, and when the Commonwealth decided to have its heads of government meeting there two years ago, uh, unlike coming here, there was a major controversy about whether Uganda was democratic enough to be the host of, of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the Commonwealth heads of government meeting. Let me just ask a question about whether, in a sense, it makes sense, given the controversy about the LRA, for the court to have accepted the hospitality of Mr. Museveni uh, next year for the review process. Thank you. Well, um, that was, uh, as regards Uganda, that was really one of the very hotly contested issues at the last Assembly of State Parties as to whether we should accept their invitation. But it was felt that Uganda being a situation country where um, there is actual um, problems on the ground, it might be useful for members to go there. But in accepting the invitation, we have also in the resolution made it abundantly clear that should the circumstances change by the time we, we will, the conference will be moved. So I think, um, and the other reason is that another country had offered to hold it, Argentina, initially it threw its hat in the ring and then withdrew and said only if Uganda cannot do it. So you were left basically with Uganda to accept and it would have been most, um, 
uh, inappropriate not to accept the invitation at that stage. Um, as regards the question of um, the role of civil society, um, I agree with you. I mean, whatever can be done to further the universality of the court, in fact, that's one of the basic roles of the NGOs, to further universality of the court, to get the court accepted worldwide. So far, there are about 110, 120 perhaps ratifications. I can't remember exactly off the top. But there are 100, 120, thanks. And there are 192, 94 countries in the UN. So we have to get the more and more countries to accept. And of course, recently, in the last two years, we had Japan joining on, and they have become the biggest financial contributor, so all the other countries are paying less contributions now. And that is the kind of snowball effect the court needs, to get the very big countries. The Nordic countries have been very good. Canada and the like-minded states have been very good in supporting it. But in as much as civil society has a role to further universality, that is the way to go, and we will continue to go, I'm sure. Yeah, could I, <clears throat> could I just make, um, make two points? First of all, one is that that's slightly unrelated to uh, <clears throat> what Mr. Phyllis Spencer asked, and that is that Mr. Robinson continues to remain as a consultant to the ICC so that if there are ideas, and possibly this is one of the, the projects that, that uh, Akuns could, could undertake, as to how the, um, <clears throat> the ICC can be reformed in the manner that, uh, that's being suggested by His Honor Justice um, Pollard. Um, we could, you know, I, I can give you the assurance that if these ideas are, are put forward, they will be um, read out to Mr. Robinson. And, and he understands and, and he would say, well, this is what ought to be done with respect of this point, that point, the other point. In other words, I'm saying um, he's still very actively engaged as a consultant to the ICC so that we should, we should use his, um, that, that current position to bring about reform in the ICC. And the other point that Mr. Philip Spencer raised is that uh, <clears throat> a number of people in Trinidad and Tobago are now involved in setting up a, a study center, a research center, which is being named after Mr. Robinson in Castara in Tobago. And that institution is in fact being physically built as, as we speak. And one of the things you would find there, you and others who might be interested in looking at smaller states as well as, as civil society and their participation, there's a considerable amount of documentation um, that, that we now have and which will be placed in the Robinson Center in Castara. For example, I remember seeing um, correspondence from Costa Rica and Vanuatu and in the paper that I, I, I prepared here, I've given the names of a number of non-governmental organizations, stakeholders in civil society who were very much involved with Mr. Robinson and the others in creating the ICC. So the point I'm making is that the information is not um, you, you know, hidden. It's, 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 very, it's, it's very much there. And if, if others wish to do research on, on, on that line, the smaller states and civil society and how they participated in the creation of the ICC and how that participation could be furthered. How, in other words, that participation can be used as a model for, for further um, development. 